Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at North Fairfield United Methodist Church. Uh, you might notice things do look a little bit different and we're a few minutes late, um, but we're trying some new technology this morning. We've had a few bugs. We'll hope to get those worked out for you sometime soon. If you can't hear us or there's a problem seeing, definitely mention that in the comments as well. So good morning again. Welcome to worship at North Fairfield United Methodist Church. We thank you for joining us. If you haven't already grabbed your Bible or you don't have your communion elements ready, you've got a second or so to get those together as well. So welcome this morning to all of you who are joining us here today and also to those who might be watching at a different time as well. We welcome you to worship as well. Certainly is a beautiful day that the Lord has gifted us with. Many days we have been gifted with as of late, and so we're thankful for that today. Um, not much in the way of new announcements for you, for the church, um, but know that we are still discussing when a good time to meet in person would be, um, perhaps after seeing what the numbers look like in the county after school is in session for a few weeks, we'll have a better idea of when we can again meet together in worship in person. A big thank you to all of those on the leadership board who completed our consult paperwork this week and got that to Leanne in a timely manner. That is much appreciated and, and a big thank you to her as well for compiling all of that information and, and getting the thoughts of many people together so that we can prepare for that important time when we share together with our um, district superintendent. So thank you again for that. Um, thank you to our tech crew who is here working diligently to, to get some new technology together for us and, and perhaps to enhance worship as well for those who will continue to join us online even after we are back together in person. So thank you for all of their hard work, not just today, but throughout the week as they've been trying new things out. So be watching for that to happen sometime soon, I'm sure. So if also, if you are mailing your offering into the church, we thank you for that. We ask that you would continue to mail that to the P.O. Box so that it can be taken care of accordingly. And we thank those who so faithfully um, take care of that for us every week so that the mission and the ministry of this church may continue. Um, we know that things are, are difficult in many ways for many folks right now, and we just thank you for your continued faithfulness um, in giving your offerings and your gifts to the church. We're grateful today. We have many joys in our hearts. I'm sure we also have many concerns as well. I would invite you to think of those joys today that, that you're celebrating. I'm sure for many it's a, a long weekend, an extra day off of work, and so we're thankful for that. But we are, we're also thankful for our work. Uh, we're thankful for our labor. We're thankful for the many ways in which we contribute to our communities and the many ways in which we contribute to the lives of those that we work with and, and how they contribute to us as well. So we are thankful for a day off, but we are also thankful for our labors and really for the opportunity to work. Um, we sometimes, on Monday morning, we're a little bit like, ah, I don't want to go in today, but it really is a gift. Work really is a gift for us, and so we're grateful for that as well today. Of course, although we don't meet together, we know that we continue to have our lives are moving forward. We have birthdays and anniversaries and, and just victories to share and to celebrate. Um, I would wish a happy birthday to my husband today. Um, he's now caught up with me for a little while, and so happy birthday to him today as well. And I'm just thankful for his presence in my life, thankful um, for my best friend in my life as well. Thank you to Dennis for sharing hymns with us as well this morning and, and sharing them on the organ a little bit different for us today and, and really helping to usher us into a time of worship. So thank you for that. Um, also, I'm sure many of you have things that you're thinking of, victories, birthdays, anniversaries. I invite you to have those on your mind today, even as we think about those things that weigh heavy on our hearts, those concerns that we have as well, and, and really some of our, our concerns, our joys as well. We are thankful for Dottie's surgery, that it went well, and we continue to pray for her and for healing. We continue to pray for Fred Moffitt and healing from his surgery as well. My husband's Uncle Bob had major heart surgery on Friday, and that all went well. And so we're thankful for that as his family, and we just ask that God would continue to bring him healing and strength each and every day. One of my coworkers, her um, 
stepfather passed away rather unexpectedly on Friday evening, and so um, she had to go right away to Florida to be with her family, and so we lift up the family of Jim Freelon as he passed away rather unexpectedly, um, and so we just ask that God would be a special comfort with his family today. We lift up our workplaces as we celebrate Labor Day, and, and we know that sometimes our workplaces aren't always easy, and sometimes things don't go as, as we have planned, but we just ask that God would be with us, would be a holy presence in us as, as we encounter one another in our workplaces. We lift up our schools today, as, as many are back in session in various forms. Um, I am celebrating that, that Ehobi, where my son goes to school, will be able to be in person a little bit more than they had planned to be, so I'm grateful for that, thankful that the virus numbers have gone down in that county as well to allow our kiddos to be in school. But we continue to pray for our teachers and our administrators and our students that they would remain healthy, that God would really place a hedge of protection around them so that they could continue to learn and to grow and, and to have contact with one another that is so important in these young ages. We lift up our communities who are in, in chaos, our communities who are hurting for various reasons. Um, we lift up those in California and in the, on the West Coast who are facing extreme heat right now and all of that that brings with it a lack of electricity and, and really just um, the suffering of being in extreme heat like that. The fires that are continuing, we lift up those who are in the path of those fires, those who are recovering, those who continue to fight those fires. We lift up those who are still cleaning up from hurricanes and probably will be facing more storms as well. And so lots, lots to lift before the Lord today. So many things that weigh heavy on our hearts and I'm sure that you have those as well. And so I would invite you as we go into this time of prayer to, to bring your joys before the Lord and to bring your concerns before him as well. And so please would you join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for your holy presence in our lives. We are thankful for the many ways in which you have allowed us to worship together, even though we are physically apart. Lord, we ask that you would give us the guidance and the wisdom to know when the time would be right, that we could come back together. We ask that you would bring together the conditions that would allow that as you have brought together the conditions that have really urged us to bring worship into homes. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Our church, our families, our homes, our church family, our work, those who we work beside and labor beside each and every day who really become for us a second family. Lord, we are thankful for that. We're thankful for the opportunity to work and also for a day of rest, helping us to really appreciate the opportunity to work. Lord, we have many joys, birthdays and anniversaries and victories of our own, and, and for that we are grateful. Grateful for your presence in our lives, for the love of your son Jesus that you simply pour upon us for no reason other than that you love us. Lord, for everything that we are thankful for today, we, it seems like we have a growing list of concerns, those that we are grateful for the healing that has taken place in their bodies, but we ask that you would continue to be with them, that you would bring them strength and healing each and every day. Lord, we lift before you families who are suffering a loss today for various reasons, and we just ask that you would place a hedge of protection around them as they travel, that you would bring peace and comfort during this time of grief. Lord, we lift our nation before you. We lift this world before you, a world that is hurting in various ways, broken in many ways. And we lift before you those who are, are facing disasters, natural disasters, and we just ask that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them for the journey ahead to recover, that those first responders who are, are working really to be a helpful hand would be strengthened and would be protected. Lord, we lift all of our, our hearts before you, the hearts of those in this church in various places. We ask that you would be with us in, in the ways that we have spoken and the ways that we have left unspoken. 
We lift this church before you today and we pray that you would strengthen us, that you would make the way clear for the new way in which you are calling us to minister to this community, to our friends and our neighbors. Lord, we offer all of this to you today. We offer this time of worship to you today and we ask that your holy presence would be with us not only in this place, but in the various places that we are worshiping today. And we pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So if you've got your Bible handy, we are going to continue in Acts. We are in chapter 9, picking up at verse 19 and going through verse 31 this morning. Actually, I'll, I'll pick up at 18 and, and move into 19 here. And so this is where we, we left off last week, and, and Saul had been in Damascus. He had been blind, and the disciple Ananias had come to him and, and laid hands on him and prayed over him, and his sight was restored. Um, immediately, uh, Scripture says, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy against the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night, and they lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and he moved about freely in Jerusalem speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we continue along in this journey through Acts, we pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes and our minds to the mission of the church, to the mission that you have called us to as disciples in, in this present world. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us during this time, that you would strengthen us and fill us with your grace and your mercy. And we pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So last week when we met together, we finished up the story of this conversion of Saul, the persecutor, into who we would know as Paul, the apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. And we remember that Saul was a Pharisee, uh, meaning that he took to the straight letter of the law, and he really felt it was God's call on his life to enforce and to uphold those laws. And so Saul went about arresting those who were followers of the way, as they were called, because they were not yet called Christians. He was arresting those who were following Jesus. Saul had perceived that those who followed Jesus and claimed him as the Messiah were really a threat to Judaism and ultimately to God. 
And so Saul is on his way to Damascus from Jerusalem, and he's going there to arrest more believers. And, and while he's on his way, he's struck blind on the road, and he goes into Damascus as Jesus had instructed him in the vision. And while he was there, he was ministered to by this disciple, Ananias. And Ananias had also had his own vision and his own instructions from God. Now Ananias knew who Saul was. He knew that he was a dangerous man. Yet out of faith and out of obedience, Ananias went to Saul as he was instructed, and he laid hands upon him, and Saul's sight was restored. In this moment, he is baptized, and Saul begins a new life as an apostle, as a follower of Jesus. We understand that Saul has experienced this complete turnaround in who he was and in how he lived his life and to whom he could attribute his life. Saul had gone from being in charge and calling the shots to now taking instructions from the very one that he persecuted. Saul had been blind to the power of Jesus, but now having been visited and healed by Jesus, Saul commits his entire life to serving Jesus and his entire life to spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth as Jesus had commanded. But there is one little catch, and it's not really even small when we think about it, but it was a little verse, it was one little sentence that Jesus said to Ananias before sending him to Saul. Saul maybe didn't know this either, but when Jesus sent Ananias to Saul, Jesus said to him, I want you to go to this man. He is my chosen instrument. He's the one that will be the apostle to the Gentiles, to the outsiders. But also, I'm going to show Saul how much he must suffer for the name of Jesus. So this would be no quiet, this would be no peaceful, pastoral ministry for Saul. It would be a dangerous, it would even be a life-threatening ministry for him. And it would start right away, right out of the gate. But this, too, was God's plan for Saul. I think, really, a plan for Saul to get noticed so that the gospel might be noticed. Now, I'm wondering if, if you've ever been in a group of people, perhaps in a community group or a board of some sort, or a group that's held responsible for making decisions, or maybe even in your group of coworkers, and for some reason, you start to feel that there's maybe a few people, or, or maybe even a more than a few, that just don't seem to like you. You just don't jive with them for whatever reason. And it starts to bother you, and, and maybe you start to feel a little hurt because you're just trying to do your best. You're just trying to contribute the best that you can. You're just offering all the good ideas that you have you're just showing up to help out whenever you can, taking the lead on a new project, speaking your mind when appropriate, and it starts to feel that all you get in return are whispers behind your back and maybe even the stink eye from your teammates. You begin to realize that you're sticking out a little bit that you've been noticed by your teammates, and perhaps not for your winning smile or your charismatic chatting, but it turns out that you've been noticed because you are an overachiever. Perhaps you've been noticed for offering constructive opinions, for being a go-getter, for being the go-to when something needs done, and even though it seems like it's a good thing to get noticed for doing good things and for being a re responsible, hard-working individual, we know that that's not always the case. 
Many times we get noticed for doing the right thing, but those who notice us don't see it that way. Instead of seeing our good intentions, they might see us as an overbearing do-gooder, or as a brown noser, or a know-it-all, or we might even be described as riding on our high horse. So it turns out that sometimes getting noticed, even for doing good, it can sometimes seem like it backfires on us. But the reality is, if we weren't doing what mattered, if we weren't making a difference, we probably wouldn't get noticed at all. Now this was the case for Saul for the entirety of his ministry. We would find through the New Testament that Saul has a cycle of getting noticed and getting into trouble. But the truth is, if he was not making a difference, if he was not ruffling a few feathers, then he probably was not being effective. Saul got noticed, Saul ruffled feathers, and he made a difference. From the very moment that Saul's sight is restored and he's baptized in Damascus, he begins to fulfill this mission to witness for Jesus and ultimately to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, which is why we are here today. If Saul had not taken on the mission that Jesus had for him, we would probably not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's possible that the story of a risen Christ, the Son of God, sent to save the people from their sins, it would have died with the Jewish believers in and around Jerusalem. If Saul had not taken on the mission that Jesus had for him, Jesus could possibly just be a character in our history books, just another prophet to be mentioned and to be forgotten in the pages. But Saul witnessed powerfully for Christ, and he got noticed, and he suffered too, but he made a difference. There was no downtime for Saul. Immediately following his conversion and his baptism, he sets about this mission to witness for Christ, and right away he gets noticed. Right away, the suffering that Christ has promised to him, it begins. After baptism, Saul spends several days in Damascus with the disciples that were living there, the same disciples that he came to arrest. And he preaches in the synagogues, and he preaches that Jesus is the Son of God, and he wastes no time in telling others what he had personally experienced. The change that had taken place in his life. Well, scripture tells us that at first the Jews in Damascus are baffled by his preaching. They knew who Saul was. They knew that he had come to Damascus with authority. He, he even had letters. He had come with authority to round up the followers of the way, and now here he was, preaching about this resurrected Christ, the very one he had sought to extinguish from the believers' minds. Now, it must have been very difficult for Saul to stand before the Jewish people in their synagogues and to basically admit that he had been wrong. That's not an easy thing for any of us to do. But he admitted that he had been wrong. He admitted that, that Jesus and his followers were not to be persecuted, but that Jesus was now Saul's everything. And without Jesus, that Saul himself was nothing. This must have taken incredible courage for Saul to admit admit to those that he had worked so hard to impress before, and now he stands before them and he admits that he's a changed man, that before he was wrong, 
in his persecution of the followers of Jesus. It probably would have been much easier for Saul to proclaim the gospel to people that didn't know him, to people that didn't know his history. They, they didn't know what he had been up to just last week. But he does it anyway. Saul is already showing courage and already proving that in no way is he ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So after many days of Saul witnessing for Christ, and scholars don't know if it was actually days or it could have been longer, perhaps a few years or so, but either way, there are those who are suspicious of him, those who have noticed him, those who do not accept Saul's powerful message about Christ, and so they begin to conspire against him. Just as those who had been threatened by the following, by the power, by the authority that Jesus was garnering when he was alive, they conspired against him as well. And so there are those who are threatened by the message of salvation through Christ that Saul was bringing. And so a conspiracy forms among the Jews to kill Saul. Well, good news travels fast, as we know, and Saul finds out about the plan. And those who plan to murder him, they keep a constant watch on the walls and the gates that surround the city at that time. Cities were surrounded by walls and gates. And they just wait for their opportunity to strike. Well, the other disciples in, the, in Damascus, they help Saul to escape. They put him in a basket and they lower him outside the city wall during cover of night. And Saul escapes. After this escape, the timeline in Saul's life is, is a bit debated <clears throat> Excuse me, by scholars. He either goes to Arabia at this time and then he returns to Damascus later, where he'll preach for three years before going on to Jerusalem. Or it's possible that this escape story that we read today is the story that occurs after he has returned from Arabia and has preached for three years. But either way, we know that, that Saul leaves Damascus, that he has escaped, and he ends up in Jerusalem. And we know that it was not immediately following his conversion, that there was at least a minimum of three years between his conversion, three years between when he was persecuting followers of Jesus before he finally arrives in Jerusalem. And this was three years of Saul preaching in Damascus, Three years of him working very hard to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was doing this so powerfully that people wanted him killed. Well, Saul escapes with his life. Ultimately, he arrives in Jerusalem, and again, right off the bat, he gets noticed. Again, he is ruffling feathers. And so it isn't long before folks in Jerusalem, they conspire to kill him as well. But when he arrives in Jerusalem, Saul tries to contact the disciples. But verse 26 tells us that they were afraid of him. Even though three years had passed, even though he had preached so powerfully in Damascus, there were some followers of Christ who still feared Saul. Some that still did not believe that he had changed, that he really, truly was now a disciple. But there was one. And it only took one. It only took one person to stand up. One person to stand out. One person to speak out. One person to do what was right. And that was Barnabas. He was a fellow disciple, and he took Saul to the others, and he stood up for him, and he vouched for him, and he told them the story of how Saul had seen the Lord and how the Lord had spoken to him. And he told the others of the story of Saul's powerful teaching and his preaching in Damascus. It was the same powerful teaching that, 
stirred the Jews there to want to kill him. This testimony of Barnabas, the story that he tells of this man Saul, it was enough to convince the others. And soon Saul was staying with the other disciples and he was moving about in Jerusalem freely and, and speaking boldly in the name of Christ. Saul teaches and he, he preaches and he debates with the Greek-speaking Jews. And it isn't long before they've had enough of him. They have noticed him. He is ruffling feathers and again, his life is in danger. Saul's preaching is so effective. His brilliant sharing of the story of Jesus is so effective and so powerful that the others there are helpless to debate him. They can't prove him wrong. They can't question him effectively. And, and so their only answer is to resort to violence. But this would not be happening if Saul's ministry was not effective. This would not be happening if he were not making a difference. And we know that it would be troubling to have one's life threatened as Saul did, but I would venture a guess that he took this in great stride. I would guess that Saul took this as a compliment to his commitment to Christ. In suffering persecution in the name of Christ, it was evident that Saul was getting noticed. And it was proof that what he was doing, the message that he was sharing, that it really mattered. So the question that I think that we have before us today is really twofold. And, and the first question is, is our witness for Christ? The way in which we live our lives, is it perhaps ruffling some feathers for the good? Are we getting noticed as those who are authentically really trying to do what is right? Are we getting noticed as those who are sincerely trying to love like Christ loved? Are we getting noticed because we're choosing mercy even when others don't understand why we would? Are we getting noticed because we choose to forgive when others don't understand? how we could. Can others even tell by the way that we live that we love and we are loved by Jesus? And secondly, I wonder, how do we react when we find out that others are indeed troubled by our witness? How do we react when we find out that others are, are a bit irritated with our attempts to live out the call on our lives, to really err on the side of grace, on the side of mercy? Does it worry us that everyone doesn't like us? And so do we step back? Do we step down? Do we apologize for the gospel? When we find out that others have noticed us, when others are, are a bit irritated with our desire to do what is right, do we stop rooting for the underdog? Do we stop looking for the grace-filled solution? All is to not offend someone. Or perhaps, like Saul, we choose to forge ahead with the race that has been put before us, even if it isn't the easy path. Perhaps, like Saul, do we find a way to tap into the courage and, and into the strength of God when we find that we're running short on our own, because really, truly, sometimes doing the right thing is tiring. We find that ultimately Saul will need to leave Jerusalem to save his life. 
because there is more work for him to do. And we know that his ministry does not end there, that it simply changed neighborhoods many, many times over. And in the time that Saul is gone, verse 31 tells us that the church in Judea and in Galilee and Samaria, it enjoyed a time of peace and, and it was strengthened and it grew in numbers. The people there were living in fear of the Lord, and they were encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Friends, if we're, if we're doing this right, or, or maybe even close to what we would consider right, we should get noticed. We should get noticed for trying earnestly to do the right thing, to err on the side of grace, to be merciful, to be forgiving. And so we might find ourselves noticed for our witness. And maybe because of that, we won't be winning any popularity contests. And perhaps the answer to ruffling feathers in the name of Christ is to continue as the believers did to live in fear of the Lord and to be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Not to be afraid of God. Not to cower in fear of him, but to live in fear of him, really recognizing the holiness of God and allowing that holiness to encourage us to continue to do the right thing, not only for ourselves, but in the name of Jesus. Perhaps when we have found that we're not winning any popularity contests and maybe we're feeling a little low about that, we can lean into this fear of our Lord, lean into this desire to continue to do the right thing, to continue to choose grace, to continue to choose mercy. And that we might find that if we're really, truly witnessing for Christ with our lives, that like Saul, we might be unpopular in some circles. We might find that we too are, are suffering in the name of Christ as Saul did, but he continued on, and, and we can continue on. We can continue on confident in our fear of the Lord, confident in our desire to do what is right, confident in our desire to honor God and to lead into the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we can. We can do that. We can continue on in the strength of God and the courage that he gives us, leaning into the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we unapologetically Live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Friends, we've got a, an opportunity to gather together today around the communion table. So I would invite you to um, gather your elements together as well, as, as we'll share in them here in just a moment. Um, I think we're going to have a, a little bit of a camera shift perhaps, so bear with us as we do that as well. Friends, I, I hope you have your, your bread and your juice gathered together this morning with your family so that we may share in Holy Communion together as God's children, as those called by his name, as those disciples who have been really called to witness to the love of Christ in the world, even when we might find that we're not winning any popularity contests for that. Friends, when, when Jesus met together with his disciples in the upper room for that last meal, they were in this place of being popular with some and unpopular with others. In fact, they were so unpopular with others that this conspiracy had come together to kill Jesus. And of course, in that room together that night, he knew 
what was coming. The rest of the disciples, they were still riding high on the, the parade that greeted them when they had come into Jerusalem earlier that week. They thought they were popular. Jesus knew differently. But they gather together for this final meal together. And Jesus does something different during the traditional Passover meal. Something that the disciples had not seen before. But it is through this holy meal together, this different thing that Jesus did, that we are strengthened. That we are strengthened for the race that has been placed ahead of us. It's one of the ways that we join together as the body of Christ, really strengthened for the call on our lives. And so Jesus met with his disciples in that room that night, and they shared that Passover meal together, and during the meal he did something different. He took the bread and he raised it to his father, and he gave thanks for it. And he said to his friend, this is my body, given for you, take and eat. Later in the meal, Jesus would take the cup, it was the traditional last cup of the meal. And likewise, he would raise it to his father and he would say, giving thanks for it, this is the cup of my blood, a new covenant. Take and drink as often as you would, and do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful that you have given us a way to come together around the communion table, around this holy table of grace. Lord, we're grateful that you invite us, not because of anything that we have done, but because of everything that your Son has done. Lord, we know that you call us to this table with, to come with clean hearts. And so we ask for forgiveness today for the many ways in which we have failed to be the disciples that you have called us to be, for the many ways in which we have failed to witness for your son. Lord, we ask for forgiveness when we have not loved one another as you have called us to love, as you have first loved us. We ask for forgiveness for the words that we have said that hurt, the thoughts that maybe were unsaid but hurt just as much. Lord, we just ask that you would forgive us, make us clean as we come together to this table, that we could be made worthy because of your love for us. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon these gifts of bread and juice, not only in this place, but in the various places that we gather today. We ask that you would make them for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That together as we partake of them, that we would be strengthened as that body. Strengthened and encouraged and made bold to witness for the love of Jesus. Lord, we offer all of this to you today as your disciples, as those who have been taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the body of Christ, broken and given for each of you. And this is the blood of Christ, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Friends, please at this time share in Holy Communion with your family.
most gracious and loving God, we thank you for this simple meal, for these gifts of bread and juice that by your power and your Holy Spirit have become for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that that same power would fill us making us bold to choose grace, to choose mercy, to choose forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us, give us courage for the road ahead. We pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, we thank you for joining us for worship today. Um, again, things might look a little bit different next Sunday. We'll, we'll We'll definitely find that out for sure by then, but we thank you for joining us, and I just pray that you would have a blessed week, that you would go in the peace and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ today, tomorrow, and forever.